to our second annual Exit Issues Breakfast and the release of our top 10 education issues for 2016. 2016 is going to be a very special year for the Public School Forum as we mark our 30th anniversary. And this annual top 10 list we've been releasing in various forms, as Mike mentioned, for more than 20 years. My good friend and predecessor, John Gordon, penned what was the first column, um, which is now sort of evolved into the booklet that you have in front of you. That illustration, if you're, those of you here at Raleigh, is from Escher, by the way. No, I think there's another week left at the North Carolina Museum Farm, so check that out. <laughs> like last year, this list serves two purposes. To highlight what we believe will be the top education issues in 2016, and what we believe should be the top issues in 2016. And with each, we share facts and background about those issues, and some guiding principles that we hope are a part of the discussion for each. Issue number one, direct adequate resources to public schools, teachers, and leaders. You can't read that. It says, to save money, we can only teach the letters A through Q. <laughs> now, okay, it's not quite that dire. Trust me. But we can do better by our students' children. Now, I had an opinion piece in Sunday's News and Observer that I know many of you read because I got a lot of emails and texts from you. Um, many of you told me how on point it was. But to be fair, some of you also told me how bad it was. So I appreciated the feedback, all of it. But my premise in writing it was to bust the myth that we can't afford to do more for our schools. Now, James Ford and I are not to be mistaken for Adam and Jamie, I don't believe. But I would suggest to you that there are many myths that need busting. And one is, is that we can't afford to do more. We can. It's a matter of priority. A series of choices, not something created by outside forces like the Great Recession. So what are our principles? First, prioritize schools and policy choices on revenue. Now, as I noted in the piece, and you'll see it in the paper, of course we need a competitive tax structure for companies that create jobs here and for taxpayers in North Carolina. But I would suggest to you that even modest changes could make an enormous difference in the amount of resources available for our children and for our public schools. We need to target funding to attract and retain great teachers and great school leaders. Now James is going to talk more about teachers in just a moment, but did you know that our average principal salary in North Carolina is 50th of 51, counting the District of Columbia? We need to fund innovation in our schools in North Carolina. That includes initiatives to support personalized learning, <coughs> STEM education, and competency-based learning. <coughs> and finally, we would encourage our policymakers, and for those of you who are here in the room to, who are really paying attention to this, to reject any calls for a so-called Taxpayer Bill of Rights or Taxpayer Protection Act. We believe that enshrining a measure like that in our state's constitution could tie our hands for decades and lock in what we believe are already inadequate resources for education. All right, issue number two is transform the profession to make North Carolina a teaching destination again. And when you look at this image, what you see is the exact opposite of the image we want popping into the minds of teachers. What it says, it's a road sign that says, we're about to leave North Carolina, better paying <laughs> teaching jobs ahead. Now, I can tell you quite honestly that having spent uh, six years in the classroom, this is an image that pops into the mind of a lot of teachers, particularly with the conditions taking place in the state. Uh, it bears noting, however, uh, that in the last budget, that we did increase beginning teacher pay from 36000 to thirty five, dollars We provided a one-time $750 uh, bonus for all teachers and administrators, as well as funding step increases. However, there's still much more work needs, that needs to be done. We rose ourselves from 47th to 42nd, uh, but in my class, that would still be below average. Teacher turnover is also at a five-year high, uh, and teachers are leaving for a myriad of different reasons. Uh, ultimately, what we have to do is make sure that no teacher ever feels as if they have to look at that road sign and make the next nearest exit. Uh, so our suggestions or our uh, recommendations are to rapidly raise teacher pay to the national average uh, salaries are not uh, everything, money is not everything, but it sure is a lot of things. Uh, the strongest signal we can send that we are serious about our teachers remaining in the state 
and securing uh, the future of this profession is rapid and rapidly increasing salaries to the national average and trying to be number one in our region. Giving uh, supporting districts in developing career advancement opportunities. We need to give districts the autonomy to innovate roles for teachers and begin to rethink education altogether so that they can create positions for teachers that maximize their human capital. Teachers have a wealth of skills and competencies that oftentimes go un overlooked and unseized. We need to give districts flexibility to develop these positions and differentiate pay scales accordingly that fills the voids and fills the needs of the systems. This would help to change the perception of teaching as a dead-end career where one only has the option to remain in the classroom or become, become an administrator. So we have to think outside the box. Also, we have to consider renewing support for UNC Colleges of Education. I think we've all heard about the rapidly diminishing teacher pipeline. Uh, we know that we get over a third of all of our teachers from the UNC system, and over the past five years, uh, the enrollment in the colleges, colleges of Education has decreased by 27%. Uh, the way we have to respond to this is by supporting the UNC system, making sure that whatever the desired gaps or misses are, that we bolster those up and provide the needed career paths into education. And for teachers like myself who took an alternative route, uh, making sure that the door is open, that there are multiple pathways of reciprocity into the career as well. <laughs> and lastly, targeting pay incentives. Um, as I mentioned before, money is not everything, but it's a lot of things. In order to fill these vacancies in the hardest to fill subjects, the highest need schools, we're quite frankly going to have to sweeten the deal. Something has to incent or entice people to fill these positions so that we can ensure that all of our children have the best instructors there for, for their service and service to service their needs, right? Love this quote from Steve Jobs, quality is more important than quantity. One home run is better than two doubles. <clears throat> we are at a crossroads in this state in terms of charter schools. Since we lifted the cap in 2011, we've seen tremendous growth in a very short time with 58 new charters as well as two new virtual charter schools that just began starting students this past year. What we want to see is to make sure that we're growing the right kind of schools, which is why our issue number three is to emphasize quality, not quantity, in charter school growth. Now, I want to be clear. There are many outstanding charter schools in North Carolina. My daughter attended one for middle school. Um, just like there are many local outstanding local public schools. We'd like to keep it that way for both. So how can we emphasize quality? We can do that by focusing on accountability as many national charter school advocates have recently spotlighted. We need to close low performing schools and provide transparency and accountability that we demand the same kind of transparency and accountability we're demanding from our local public schools. We need reliable research on who charters serve and how well they serve them. It was in the news recently that Lieutenant Governor Forrest voiced concerns about a report on charter schools he felt was too negative. <laughs> Actually, last year we proposed in our top 10 list that we needed solid data gathered by reputable researchers, including demographic information, which is at the heart of the Office of Charter Schools report. So clearly, there's still a need for better information and better research than we have. Compromise to achieve fair funding formulas and practices. Charter schools are public schools, and charter school students are public school students, and they should be supported that way. There were attempts last session to find a fair way to change the funding formula to make sure that uh, all of our students are getting a fair shake, and we encourage that, that conversation to continue because we think we can do better. Finally, we should pursue very cautiously on virtual charter schools. The track record in other states is very mixed, and in the end, it will be the students who will be harmed most if we don't provide a high quality education. Number four is elevate race as a focal point of public education. For those in the back who may not be able to see this image, this is illustrative of a very unfortunate phenomenon that's taking place within our schools. And that is you have students of color that are lined up in what looks like the threshold to enter the school, but as they pass through that threshold, the scenery changes and it looks more like a Department of Corrections than it does a schoolhouse environment. Uh, when we look at the data, this is clearly what's still happening. It is an unfortunate and un uncontrovertible fact that race still matters. Race still incredibly is still incredibly significant in determining several aspects 
of the educational outcomes of students, from what school a child goes to, to what courses are made available to that student, all the way down to how discipline is handled and even in achievement. So racial gaps continue to pervade us, and I think it's most appropriate considering the day after a racial justice and social justice champion, Dr. King's uh, holiday, that we continue to lift up these issues to the forefront in terms of our academics. And so our suggestions are to apply disparate impact lens to racial analysis. The subtle nature of racial inequality uh, is that it can often show up even when we're not looking for it. Unfortunately, uh, where there may not even be deliberate attempts, either in policy formation or execution, there is oftentimes still racialized outcomes, and, the, and those outcomes tend to be color-coded. Uh, our best bet at safeguarding ourselves and our children against these sort of inequities is to make sure that we disaggregate data in its collection to see if students of color are being disproportionately or disparately impacted. Create racially and socially, economic, uh, socially economically inclusive and integrated schools. I most recently wrote an article in Charlotte Magazine about uh, what school segregation looks like. I talked about my own personal experience having grown up in the 80s and 90s uh, through de desegregation and then my experience working in the high schools in Charlotte Mecklenburg, uh, which tend to be racially and socioeconomically isolated. Um, it, se it seemed to resonate with a lot of people because it's indicative of a national trend, but one that is very pronounced, not just in Charlotte, but in other counties and other districts throughout North Carolina, be it Halifax, be it Pitt, uh, the list goes on. This is something we need to pay careful attention to, uh, and even in wake where we're trending back, we need to make sure we're being inclusive in our pursuits. Eliminate racial gaps in student discipline. It's a matter of fact, the students of color are as much as 4.2 times more likely to be suspended for the same offenses. Now, while all suspensions have gone down, those gaps have not closed significantly. This is something we need to pay attention to. Recruit and retain more teachers of color. Uh, whereas race is not an indicator necessarily of one's ability to teach, it is incredibly important in a school district or in a system where the majority of students are now non-white that uh, we can no longer have the majority of teachers, 84% to be exact in North Carolina, not look like the population that they're serving. Research has shown that even has an impact on student achievement. And lastly, embracing more culturally responsive pedagogy, the sorts of practices that embrace and respond to the different and disparate backgrounds that students come from, and let everyone know that they're worthy and that they're welcome to receive a quality education. I admit that I love internet memes. I know I'm not <laughs> This has always been one of my favorites. You can read it. It says, 83% 80, of high poverty schools received a D or F, but less than 1% of affluent schools did. Tell me again how this system measures the quality of the school. <laughs> Issue number five, fix the broken A to F grading system. This was on our top 10 list last year, and the public school forum is going to keep beating the drum on this issue until we fix it. The current A to F school system does not work, does not reflect the outstanding job that our teachers and our school leaders in our most challenged schools across North Carolina do every day. If the intent of the letter grade system is to provide information about the kind of job our schools are doing, then we must find a better way than basing 80% of that grade on single point in time standardized tests. Growth factors, while also imperfect, is a much better indicator of how well the school is doing. So let's emphasize growth. I think we can make some movement on this issue in 2016. We would encourage to commit to the 15-point scale for now until we can only make changes to that if it's in conjunction with overall formula changes. We should learn lessons from the demographics. Do you know 12 of the 17 higher poverty schools, schools that have less more than 50% low income students or early college high schools. So there's something going on there, would seem to be. So let's understand what's happening and what they're doing right. Finally, if the intent is to help the schools who are doing poorly, then where's the support? Or is the intent, unfortunately, as Senator Rucco recently said, the letter grade system is working exactly as designed to show that the public school system has failed. This letter grade system needs to be fixed or it needs to be scrapped. If we're going to use school letter grades, let's actually use them to identify the many schools that do need support and let's provide it. My material is not nearly as funny as Keith's, but I tried on this one. So this is a, a, a political cartoon that I think really illustrates the issue with uh, struggling schools. So number six is support state struggling schools. 
you have a teacher on the first day of class in the first grade classroom and there's a bunch of students and it says, hi, we're every social problem in America that you can, that you can name rolled into a herd of too many humans for one mere mortal to manage, let alone teach, where do you want us to sit? And I think it kind of <laughs> illustrates what's taking place in the classrooms. The next follow-up question to, why, uh, to struggling schools is why are schools struggling? And I think it says a really good job of representing that. So our suggestions are to amend the definition, as Keith mentioned, of low-performing schools. We believe that the definition as it currently stands is flawed. The greatest indicator of how a school does is more demographic. These are things that have nothing to do with the teaching quality taking place in the classroom and everything to do with the experiences and the backgrounds that students come from. Support low performance schools by reinvesting in those schools and in their communities. We have to go beyond just labeling these schools as low performing and actually doing something about it by offering necessary support. I do want to be clear in saying that there are different ways to approach this, anywhere from innovation zones to uh, achievement or recovery school districts. Uh, and we, for one, are open and inviting of new ideas. It's worth noting that uh, we, the forum, have embarked on our biannual study group on education opportunities, one of our focus areas is on low performing schools. And so we most recently had Dr. Alan Coverstone from Metro Nashville Public Schools come in to talk about his work with the innovation zones and the turnaround work. So there are multiple approaches and we're inviting for all suggestions and ideas. Uh, demand no excuses mentality. There needs to be a first, a fierce urgency of now and we can't have any excuses because the lives of our students hang in the balance um, and so we have to do something about it. There are plenty of excuses uh, that may be founded on a broken system or on students that can't learn, but we don't accept those excuses. We believe turnaround is necessary. And we need to adopt evidence-based approaches. I think it goes without saying that the currency of whatever we're doing has to be grounded in empiricism. In Look at what works, not based on conjecture. Replicate those things and bring them to scale for all students. Sometimes I think mommy is happier than me when I don't have homework. <laughs> now trust me, uh, I'm proud of my liberal arts education from the University of Chapel Hill, but this political science major is not a lot of help when my daughter is bringing home calculus from Henlow or chemistry. So I use this cartoon to represent at least one of the complaints and concerns voiced over the transition to a different set of standards in North Carolina based on the Common Core. That homework is too difficult and too hard to understand for parents to help. I get that, I do. It is different than how many of us learn math. And yes, all the standards today are more rigorous and higher than they've ever been before, but surely we don't wanna take a step back on high academic standards because it's hard. That's why our issue number seven is maintain high standards for North Carolina. We encourage the state to follow the process that was set up in legislation two years ago to have the State Board of Education under the fine, terrific leadership of Bill Covey to evaluate the recommendations from the Academic Standards Review Commission. The State Board at that point can improve things, can change things, can reject recommendations that they don't believe will benefit the state. That includes, in our view, they should wholesale reject any efforts, which fortunately did not come out of the commission, to simply replace our standards with another state standards and start all over again. We need to listen to educators who clearly oppose simply scrapping the standards. A group representing North Carolina's math teachers has been very vocal about their concern. Let's listen to our teachers who are exhausted, frankly, from constant change and policy whiplash. Look, transitioning to new standards isn't perfect. It wasn't perfect. What we hear from teachers overall, though, is, is uh, largely positive. And where there are criticisms, let's address those. But let's let our teachers teach, and let's provide the professional development support they need to do their jobs. Number eight is make evidence-based decisions on expansion of private school vouchers. <coughs> this is a proverb from that great financial sage, uh, Warren Buffett. Never test the depth of a river with both feet. Uh, this is kind of our call to be measured and be metered and exper experimenting with new ideas. Uh, I think it's safe to say we should probably dip our toe in first before we end up uh, over our head, so to speak, or underwater. Um, so, our, of course, we know that um, in 2015, the North Carolina Supreme Court upheld opportunity scholarships. Since then, 
funding for those scholarships has increased exponentially. Uh, but the results on whether or not it actually leads to increased student outcomes is inconclusive. The results are somewhat mixed. And with that in mind, our suggestion is to limit program expansion until, unless and until research has shown the positive impact of vouchers. Um, again, in the interest of being evidence-based, we're looking for positive impact uh, before we proceed forward. No matter our position on the issue or where we may come from philosophically, we have to agree that that standard of measurement, again, has to be rooted in empiricism. To keep the use of vouchers limited to high-quality educational options to disadvantage students. Uh, the ideological thrust behind making vouchers available in the first place has been predicated on giving disadvantaged students the chance at success. If this is truly our objective, then we have to keep that population in our, in our sights even as we expand the program to a greater population. And lastly, reject the efforts to create uh, education savings accounts. Of course, these are taxpayer-funded accounts given directly to families uh, who can opt out of education. They can use these funds to support the educational expenses of their children. We view this as a very dangerous proposition, one that is somewhat of a gamble or a reneging on our obligation to fully fund our schools, and one that actually stands to have more of a negative impact than a positive one. First the birth canal and now preschool. When will this end? <laughs> there are a few aspects of education that have as much evidence to support investment as early childhood education. We know that children who enroll in high quality preschool programs, they fare better in school and in life. They score better on math. They score better on literacy. They come to school more ready to learn. They persist and graduate at higher rates. And there's even benefits that extend into adulthood. Look at the, um, the, the section of the book. I, was, uh, I learned a lot myself just as we were researching these things. This stuff works, which is why issue number nine for us is invest and expand access to high quality early childhood education. North Carolina has long been a leader in early childhood education, but for us to remain a leader, we need to increase funding to pre-recession levels. I think legislators on both sides of the aisle recognize the strong return on investment. The General Assembly should prioritize expend, increased spending in this high impact area. And we should <coughs> unite around third grade reading success. Give a lot of credit to the General Assembly for their leadership on Read to Achieve. I think it has served, among other things, as a driving force to focus on the importance of being able to read by third grade. That is, I think, all of our education research shows that's when we sort of transition um, uh, from learning to read to read to learn. It's critically important. And we should use those, get our, all of our stakeholders, which includes everyone in this room, um, to focus in on that as a key indicator for success in North Carolina. Our tenth and final issue is build bridges for students through expanded learning. And uh, it's kind of, this is kind of a play on those keep calm posters, and it says instead, remain curious and keep learning. I think this is kind of an appropriate bow to put on our wrapping up of these issues because I think it encapsulates everything we talked about. Uh, there's a common misnomer that learning only takes place inside the classroom, but as a teacher, I know that after that bell rings, there are numerous opportunities for students to still learn and get into all sorts of activities. So it's incumbent upon us to respond to that. Uh, we have increased funding and expanded our expanded, uh, extended our expanded learning opportunities over the past 10 years. And yet still, two out of five children still don't have access to these sorts of programs. So it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we respond to that need and really, uh, cap really capture that market. So our suggestions are develop and implement strong quality review for expanded learning opportunities. This review should take into account program goals, leadership staff, programming, it's our way of quality controlling these programs to make sure that we're embracing the best practices and expanding those to all of those who offer them. Provide access to quality data control tool uh, for program use. I, you know, before I became a teacher, I worked in an after school setting. I was a director of a teen center. And I can tell you that it's nothing, there's nothing better than the ability to collaborate with other folks to be able to share data uh, and see what's working so that we're ultimately um, pulling our weight and all this shit together. This would offer a similar resource to what we know with home base when it comes to teachers uh, for expanded learning programs. Create and publicize expanded learning career paths. Policymakers, funders, program operators should help the, help the future of expanded learning opportunity professionals by creating careers in the field. Um, if we want to have the kind of workforce that we're looking for, 
where we have uh, people who are in, involved in STEM and experts are going to have to be able to bolster that with sort of supports that are go beyond the classroom. So we need to create pathways and, and viable careers for individuals even after the school hours to make sure that they're helping students to launch their career trajectories as high as they possibly can. As a teacher, I can tell you there's nothing better than having somebody else there to help support your students in the after school hours and so we can create those sort of opportunities on behalf of those who look for those careers.